I'm very pleased to introduce today Paolo Jofra from the University of Hidalgo Palace in Santiago. Paolo is an expert in stellar spectroscopy specifically, um, but is also the director of the Nuclear Millennial Eris collaboration, which is a big scheme that's aimed at incorporating some techniques from biology into galactic archaeology. We'll get some more about that today. Paula obtained a PhD from MPA in Munich. Uh, she was then a postdoc at Bordeaux and Cambridge in the UK before moving to UDP in Santiago as a professor and have been there since. In addition to that astronomical career, she has an astronomical number of things that she's done and been involved in. So here's, here's the list. <laughs> we'll just start in 2018 so that it doesn't take too long. So um, she was voted top 10 scientists to watch by Science News, an international award. Then in 2019, uh, she was one of the top 100 women in science, according to Time magazine. I don't know if you've heard of Time. Of those uh, in 2021, she then won one of the 30 ambassadors for the image of Chile, followed by publishing her book, Cosmic Fossils which looks at the role of women in astronomy, it's the most in some of the big names, female names in astronomy over the past. And then in 2023, to add to that, Forbes awarded her one of the 30 most powerful women in Chile. So she can also <laughs> beat you with an arm <laughs> Having said that, I will pass over to Paula, who will be talking about galactic biogenetics. Thanks, uh, Rob, for the intimidated introduction. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I, in the pandemic, actually, I wrote a book after I was in selected in time. The, an editor of a journal wanted me to write a book about galactic phylogenetics, but at that time I didn't, we didn't have, uh, we didn't make, I've done so much work on that, so I wanted to write it instead about galactic astronomy. And I was writing the book, and then I was writing, for example, about galaxy evolution and chemical evolution, and then I was thinking about Chiaki. And then I was thinking about all these uh, great uh, scientists, and I thought that I didn't want to write that this was my stuff because I was also work done by many other people. So I started reaching out all these different women, and I started including them in the book, and it became like a book about galactic astronomy and how women are doing galactic astronomy these days. And it's been very interesting because lots of people, obviously it's a book in Spanish, for the public, lots of people have said, oh, I didn't know that there were so many women doing science. It's like, yeah, they are. So that's kind of cool. Um, I gave the book to Chucky. It's, it's a shame to have missed her today, but that's how things work. We are constantly very busy doing lots of stuff. So anyway, this, uh, all these recognitions come from uh, a crazy idea that started when I was in Cambridge, actually. I was invited to present um, how we in astronomy present, uh, make plots of our results and show these plots to the scientific community and explain our results. And I was the astronomer invited, then there was a biologist invited, was an engineer invited, and a person working on medicine. And we made a panel because um, the colleges in Cambridge, they love panels, and they did a panel on that. So the lady that organized that was a postdoc working on the history of arts, and she wanted to see how uh, science has evolved from hiring an artist to make them plot to today the area of the computers. So I brought the etch diagram showing how 100 years ago the etch diagram looked very much similar to the etch diagram of Gaia, just with more points. But then there was this biologist, Rob Foley, who is the last one in the list there, who showed an evolutionary tree saying that this is how they use, uh, this is the diagram that they use to study histories in evolutionary biology. And that kept me thinking because I was working in the field of galactic archaeology, measuring chemical abundances of stars to reconstruct histories of the Milky Way. That was the topic of my postdoc. And I was very intrigued by not having se seen any evolutionary tree uh, with stars. So then I went and said, I want to do this with stars. And then we started discussing and having lots of dinners at Kings and wine after that. and cheese and so on and Porto and all these things that they do there until we published our first paper on that in 2017. We got a lot of people criticizing that that wasn't possible. I didn't care because it was super exciting and fun to work with all these biologists and in Kings everyone was, so how is the project going in the evening? So we were discussing with everyone 
So I didn't really care when people were like, that doesn't work. And then I was very happy when it got uh, selected in uh, Scientists to Watch. So that could then be used as a way of uh, telling the funding agencies to, um, you know, maybe maybe there is something here. So what's invest, uh, investing resources on it. And then I applied to this uh, Nucleo Milenio, which is like a big project. It's a collaboration. So I cannot do it myself alone. I need to have a group. So the group has uh, Patricia Tisera, who also gave, gave a talk here a couple of months ago. Um, so she's in Chile as well. She's the co-director. And then it's Alvaro Rojas and Evelyn, who are uh, also PIs, because we need to be a group of at least four people. And then we have other international collaborators, Rob, here, Sha, Fire, and Arnold Foley, who have been very much uh, involved in the development of, of this idea since the beginning and that contributed also when we got that grant. And we use all the prices to say, look, it is promising. Please, government of Chile, give us money. We want uh, this to be also led uh, from Chile. I name uh, in the second list uh, most of the, the students that have been doing most of the plots. We just discuss and they do the, the plots. So. Where did this idea come from? This is a very old, uh, very basic slide that uh, relates star formation with galaxy evolution. We know that stars are forming groups, right? And that these groups are have uh, stars that are all very similar. The thing that is different among them is, is their masses, or I'm going to close here a little. I, I don't have the mouse. Sorry to interrupt this, but um, I also had myself looking at me all the time and it was a bit irritating. Um, no, I just, yeah, maybe I need a laser because I don't see the pointer here. I'll yes. just like that and then I can tell. Can I? You switch it on. Ah, I have to switch it on. Oh, on. Okay, so yeah, so we have uh, stars that are forming groups. These groups share the chemistry, so the chemical composition of this cloud, that is the mother cloud of these stars. And then you have stars that are some more, more that are more massive and others that are less massive. And the massive ones quickly die, explode. And then a new generations of stars is formed. And the difference between this new generation and the old generations is the chemistry, which is in this cartoon illustrated with a different color. So then the massive stars of the second generation die, they produce new chemical elements inside. They in, uh, inject these uh, elements in the in the cloud again, and then the new generations of stars form again. So then you have these small stars that they live longer. So we can find the very old stars that are in, encapsulating in their atmospheres the chemical composition of these clouds at the moment that these generations of stars was formed. So. Um, very basically, this is the process of uh, star formation and, and chemical evolution. And in a, in a way, it is obviously, as you may know, much a bit more complicated than that. But this is kind of the distribution in masses of, of the stars. So there are some that are more massive and some that are less massive. And the most massive ones quickly die uh, with the supernova events. And then they will produce um, elements like these elements here. Um, then you have other stars that die a little bit later uh, in binary system and explode the supernova type 1a, populating then the environment with the other set of elements that happen a bit later. Then there are other stars that when they have winds, they start ejecting the outer material, um, producing other kinds of elements and donating them back into the interstellar medium. And finally, we have the suns and the stars that are uh, of low mass here, which die there, which live there forever and ever and don't do anything. But then they record in the atmosphere the chemistry of, of this uh, original gas cloud that gave, that form all these stars. So the importance here is that the chemical elements, so the metals, as we like to call them in astronomy very vaguely, are the tracers of uh, the different evolutionary processes that are happening in the in the universe. On one hand, stellar evolution, all these time scales and the production mechanism of all of all these elements, but also um, interactions between galaxies and and mixing processes and so on. This is a figure that you probably all know here quite well because it was done by by Chucky and then was uh, 
made it prettier by the designers of the Gala survey uh, and shows uh, how the different chemical elements evolve with time. So in the x-axis is time and in the y-axis is abundance. And one can see the colors depending on the different stars as uh, shown before and their magnitude and, and when they start appearing. So one can see from this periodic table how each element in a way evolves at a different time scale and um, at a different magnitude. So the metals, we can relate these uh, chemical abundances as, it's, as, as if they were the DNA of the interstellar medium. And then the stars, the low mass stars that we look when we look at the sky, these are the fossil records that share uh, the history of, uh, of the interstellar medium. So when we're thinking about the tree of stars, we're think we're, what we're really doing is a tree of the interstellar medium. The stars are just the fossil records. It's not the, the stars themselves that are evolving. That took us kind of one and a half year of discussion with the biologists. But we can, when we think about that, which is something that we, for us, is a co concept that we have been using for a long time, uh, that the stars are the fossil records, we make ourselves these kind of questions, right? Uh, which, uh, of the older populations that were living in the sky here are responsible for the chemical pattern of the younger stars that we see today. We can also, using the chemistry, ask us the question of which are the fossil records that can explain the chemical composition of a specific star. And that is one of the typical things that people do when, when they try to understand the nature of the pop three stars by looking at the chemistry of the, of the pop two stars, for example. So these kind of questions that we use and that we do ourselves all the time in, in the field of galactic archaeology, I've come to, to realize that these are the, the questions that don't appear there. Oh, that's interesting. Ah, yeah. Yeah, the questions that are in many other uh, evolutionary studies. Try to understand the present data by making the questions of what happened in the past. So that is the, the question that is done in evolutionary studies. So the hypothesis is then of uh, EDIS, which means evolutionary reconstruction of the interstellar medium. That's where the name comes from. So if the chemical pattern of low mass stars is uh, corresponds to the fossil record of their birth ISM, and if we use many fossils, we can reconstruct the formation and the evolution of the Milky Way, then what we have is a standard evolutionary problem. So, like other evolutionary problems, we have uh, also here uh, um, the theory of the sampling modification happening. So in every evolutionary study in biology, uh, when you have information that is passed from one generation to the other, the sense that is modified, then you have evolution. If you don't have modification, you cannot have evolution because everything remains the same. So you need change for it to happen. And you need to have a descent. So it cannot be just some random difference between one and the other. There needs to be kind of a directional effect of what's happening with one generation that will be passed to the other one. So this is the key that Darwin at some point found that explained the theory uh, of evolution, which is descent with modification. And this is something that I believe that we have in chemical evolution in, uh, in galaxies. And essentially, that means that with time, all these small changes that happen from one generation to the other start to accumulate. And then at the end, uh, the, 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 there is a diversification that is increasing with time. So in our case, the driver of the sent with the modification of the ISM is the nucleosynthesis happening inside the stars. So that's again the project, Galactic Phylogenetics. These are the, the BIs, that's me, Patricia that came here, Alvaro and, and Evelyn, uh, a nice picture that they took in October. And so let's start trying to put these two things together, the biology and, and the astronomy. And, and I want you to see how, how we're trying, what we're doing is essentially the same than what, what uh, they're doing. So this is a book. Uh, written by Lyndon uh, Bo Broman. I never know what the R goes. She's a supervisor of Keegan. Uh, so Keegan recommended me this book and it's a fantastic book. It is like really for people that don't know anything about 
molecular evolution. It's everything explained with beautiful cartoons, with beautiful examples, a highly recommended book. Um, so I open it up for, for this presentation and I just took this concept. So it, this is really the introduction of this book. But in evolutionary biology, the idea is to connect the changes of individual genomes to population level processes and then to the gen understanding the generation of diversity. And in chemical and galaxy evolution, we can connect the changes in the stellar abundance to the star formation histories and then to assembly of galaxies. So it's also these kind of three steps. And then the information of all these levels, like individual genomes, population level, and the diversity in general, is encoded in the genome. And in our case, the information of all these levels is really encoded in the chemical abundances of all these low mass stars. Um, what people do in phylogenetics, why it is not here sometimes? Yeah, what people do in phylogenetics is uh, the information that they can extract when they analyze these DNA sequences is on one hand, identify individuals. So we do that too. They try to illuminate interactions among individuals. That's also what we try to do. Understand the evolution and impact of major historical events. That's what we try to do. Uh, tracing the origin of the different lineages. We also try to understand the origin of the different stellar populations. And uh, obviously investigating the tempo and the mode uh, of evolution over all the time scales. So that's the kind of things we try to do when we have a sample of uh, chemical abundances of, of stars that have different ages and across the different galaxies. Um, so in, in our case, we compare models and data. We do that all the time. We have uh, in our models, we have different parameters, the initial mass function, different yields that produce the chemical elements, star formation rates, feedback mechanism, some uh, prescription for the time delay in stellar evolution, how the gas is mixed, the rotation of the star, which may generate more or less abundance, um, chemical abundances, and stars may leave more or less or winds and so on. When we collect the data, we also have to think about the several aspects like which spectral lines are we going to consider to extract the information, the, res the resolution of the signal to noise of our data, what model atmosphere, which radiative transfer code, and also at the end we have to be able to uh, reconstruct back where the stars come from because stars have migrated from where they come from and they need to just integrate back the orbits to see where they were born. And at the very end, one makes a kind of plot like this, again, taken from one of Chiaki's papers, where there are all the elements and all of these points are what we can measure after looking at all of that for the different elements. And then these are lines here correspond to different models that are considering different perspectives for, for uh, yields and supernovas and, and so on. So then uh, we can explain a little bit what's happening in chemical evolution by, by essentially comparing um, whether these lines and, and these data points are more or less agreeing on the trends. Um, and I think that we can learn from evolutionary biology to compare models and data with other kind of diagrams and not this uh, multi-panel scatter line, colorful, symbol, full plots which are heavy and they have a lot of information and that it's good on one hand, but on the other hand, sometimes they are uh, a bit overwhelming <laughs> and difficult to plot. So we can come back to Darwin, who was the most important uh, person that uh, gave shape to the theory of evolution. Uh, coming back to this concept of the centric modification. So when there is a, a heredity, meaning that what the offspring or what the ancestral dust has a direct impact on the offspring. Well, so when there is heredity, there is essentially information that is passed down and modified from one generation to the next. And that these generations can be studied and, and visualized through the famous tree of life. And that is what Darwin had the, this idea or, or revolutionary idea that every organism on the planet is connected um, because they share this evolutionary information. He didn't even know what was the information that was shared. He just knew that or inferred that it was something that was connecting everything. It was just hundreds of years later that it was discovered that this was a DNA. 
So um, what about the, the tree of stars? I mean, the stars are sharing the same kind of information, which is through this chemistry. So we must, we should be able to connect all of them through, through a tree. This is an illustration of how it should look a tree of stars made uh, by, by, by Keegan uh, in his PhD thesis. Uh, so this is the first uh, thesis that has a chapter on this topic. Uh, and yeah, so you have your first generations of stars forming groups. So each of them is a different branch here or coming out from the same root, so to say. And then there is the second generation that forms here and then makes new stars. So you, you have, after some time, uh, a second of generations of star giving another branching pattern here. So we have been trying to do this uh, more rigorous, uh, with more rigorous than this uh, cartoon here. Um, and I will come to that uh, in a minute. So Darwin, this is the only tree in, uh, in the book of the origin of species of, of Darwin. And essentially he said, if everything's connected and we can have this tree of life, then um, we can use this tree of life to explain the evolutionary processes that is happening. And that is the phylogenetic tree. So it's a branching pattern that it tries to explain the, the diversification of all the, the beings. And branching diagrams are a logical way to represent hierarchical structure. It is widely used. We use it all the time also to understand how things are distributed. But the difference between this phylogenetic tree and any other tree is that we are using this phylogenetic tree in a way to explain also this diversification and tell a story in a way, reconstruct the history. So, yeah, great. Let's build trees of stars and let's just reconstruct histories. Well, it's not so uh, simple, we have come to appreciate. So there are a lot of technical aspects that we have to consider. The first one is that there can be so many trees and that's a problem because you cannot possibly evaluate all the possible trees. So uh, that is like a typical um, table that shows that sequences here would be data sets. So imagine that you take 10, 10 stars or 10 galaxies and you do this. This is all the possible trees that you can compute. So just by getting to 50, they are more than a number of particles in the universe of possible trees that can come out by distributing them. So you cannot explore them all to see which is the most likely one because that's computationally infeasible. So one has to come up with ways, more smarter ways to make trees that do not go over evolving, uh, improving them all. Also things that are, that's all part of the book, just pictures of, of pages in this book, but there are kind of things that we have to come familiar with, but you, if you turn the, the node like A and B and you turn them like that, then you get, this is the same tree. So when you, when you order the tips and then you swap them like that, the tree has the same topology, so it's the same tree, it's the same history, and that um, that's so, some of the things that we need to get familiar with. And also where to put the root has an important uh, impact when you reconstruct the history, because this is the past, this is the present, you can put the root here between node A and B and C, just here, and that can tell you that C and D are, are more related than A and B. But if you put the roots between C and D, you get a tree like that that tells you that C is more related than A and B than D. So the, the way of reconstructing history has a super imp uh, important impact of where you put the root. And that leads to discussions that can take uh, months. There are other fundamental aspects that this is where people have put a lot of criticism on what we're trying to do. One of them is that what we were discussing in the office no, before, like not all information is passed vertically. So in astronomy, we don't necessarily have one ancestor leading to many offspring. Um, but that, and this is uh, called horizontal transfer and also hybridization processes. And they happen in biology a lot. So people are starting to make, instead of these trees, they are starting to make a lot of networks these days. Uh, and we think that in astronomy, we may have kind of a very, complicated network rather than a, than a tree. And it's not, therefore, that Darwin is not correct and we cannot implement or adopt their uh, tools. It's that, you know, these histories are complicated, but there is already some knowledge in, in evolutionary biology how to deal with, with these complications. And I think that we can contribute from our side to what they are doing with networks. 
There is also another interesting thing, which is that genes evolve differently. Uh, so that means that when you take, when you make a tree with one gene or with another gene, you may get to trees that are conflictive because they are telling different stories because they are evolving differently. So this is an example here of trees computed uh, with different genes and they are kind of all very different from each other. So they are conflictive. People are discussing a lot about conflictive trees, but in our case, thinking that if I make a tree using oxygen or iron or chromium, which are evolving differently, then it is kind of expected that I'll get to different trees because I will be telling different stories. So it's not a problem of the method. I think it's a good thing that we have all these uh, different processes happening because they are telling us different part of the, of the story. So some results stuff that we have tried to do and that we have been doing. So we look at stars. All right, so one more consideration. When we want to do it for ourselves, we, how do we start, right? So we don't have a model, of course, because uh, this is transdisciplinary, so no one has done a model for galaxy evolution. We cannot adopt the models from biology because it's just different, what is happening in biology with what is happening in the Milky Way or in galaxies. So because we don't have a model, we need to start with the most simple one, which is a treat that based on distance space method. And the method we're trying to do, we're using is the neighbor joining method. And it takes a distance matrix. So here, this is a cartoon, five stars. We put them in rows and columns. It's a distance matrix and we compute the distance, uh, which is the chemical distance in our case, because the chemistry is our DNA. Uh, between star one and star two, obviously the distance between them is, is zero. So it's a diagonal matrix with, which is symmetrical, so we can take the bottom part. And we can use an Euclidean distance, a Manhattan distance, or any other distance measurement that one could think of. And uh, you can use the elements in any way that you can imagine and play with it. And uh, we still don't have any conclusion of what is the best way to proceed. But essentially you take a distance matrix and from the distance matrix, then there is a clustering algorithm, which is this neighbor joining that will go and will take the smallest distance and will make a node. And then it will compute a secondary node and then will be kind of putting the hierarchical difference of this distance matrix in the shape of a, of a tree at the end. So this is a Tasna Sumeni model. It's very straightforward, it's very fast. Uh, so we can do a lot of trees with a lot of stuff and then get uh, excited and confused at the same time. So example is uh, Keegan's uh, PhD chapter. He took a sample of solar twins uh, in the Milky Way disk, a sample um, published by Gerda Gasali. Uh, we like that sample because it's very homogeneous. The analysis is done very precise. It's very precise. It's 400 stars. The differences in chemistry of the stars are because the stars are different in chemistry and not because there is a systematic effect when we measure the abundances. Ages for, for stars like the sun, they are well determined because the isochrons for stars like the sun are best calibrated. So everything is perfect with this data set. So this is why we, uh, we liked solar twins for, for so much time. So he played uh, with this data set. He's a biologist working on, on fossils. So his uh, paper had a lot about migration, birds uh, and stars, which was like an interesting PhD. Um, and that's uh, the tree he found. And what I want to highlight from this tree, I asked him to do compute age metallicity relations of, of these groups here. Um, and this is the slope of the age metallicity relations of, of the different groups. And you may see that the, the slopes are, are different, which in a way can tell us something about each of these groups that are found in this tree, maybe the result of a different evolutionary history or chemical enrichment rate, that they all happen to come here to the solar neighborhood because of radio migration. So we should run some further analysis on, on because we know the Gaia data of the stars on, on where they come from and there is still work uh, to be done in, in this direction. But that's kind of cool. Then we made ourselves the question about what happened if we take a, a spectroscopic survey, because uh, this work from Casali is just data taken from the literature. All the stars are actually stars that the planet hunters have been observed with, with harps. So it's all in the archive data, but these are all stars that were selected to be potential planet hosts. 
So there is not, we don't know if it's a well representation of the solar neighborhood or how the stars were selected. So looking in surveys is better because the selection functions are uh, easier to deal with in principle. So we looked at Gala. Uh, but Gala has uncertainties that are very high. And then we found that the trees were not supported at all. So we were not very happy. So we had to improve the uncertainties first. And this is uh, the work of uh, Kurt, a mathematician working uh, with me in Chile. So he ran a machine learning algorithm on the solar twins uh, of Gala. Uh, this machine learning algorithm is called the Canon. It's a polynomial that uh, is trained to uh, to fit uh, the data once trained with um, a training set uh, that of data of higher quality. Um, I don't want to go into details here, but one of the by side uh, products of here is that we have this catalog of 40,000 solar twins for which we have a very high precision um, abundance analysis of all, all these elements. So you can see the normal Gala data set with the contours and then in colors, uh, or SAR or, or, or catalog. And then we selected uh, 200 stars from, from here and we compared the trees uh, between uh, what would be the standard DR3 um, abundances and the canon abundances for the same set of stars. And we find firstly that not the same stars get to the same branches, of course, the abundances are different. And secondly, that the, the length of the tips uh, are longer here than here. And we know that this is more similar to a random tree than this one, which is uh, uh, good. And then we wanted to make an interpretation of these groups uh, that are kind of with the shades here to see if they could have some astrophysical, I don't know, explanation. Uh, this is compared here. Uh, this is uh, abundance ratio that we call chemical clock as a function of age. And the dash line here is what people have been finding in the literature for solar twins. And we find that for, for one of the groups, we find a beautiful agreement with this uh, benchmark relation, which is something we don't find in the Gala data, but we find it with our uh, Canon data and our twin. Um, so the chemical clocks that is found that is found for solar twins in the literature, we find it when we have these high precision abundances plus or, or tree analysis on top of it, uh, we don't find it for Gala. What does it mean? Um, honestly, I don't really know. <laughs> in parallel, there is uh, Sara Vitali who published um, recently a paper on chemical clocks. She analyzed uh, 90 uh, radiant stars with very, very good spectra from UV and K2 giant stars for which we know the ages from astro seismology, so the ages are very good. And we find that this relation, this is the, again, this Nissan relation here, is applicable for solar metallicities, but then uh, kind of gets flatter and flatter with, with lower metallicity. So this relation changes a lot with metallicity, and it also changes a lot depending on the star formation rates, so the galactic environment. So we don't think that these chemical clocks are necessarily something that may trace inheritance, which means that the fact that these clades have these chemical clocks, uh, right? It's not, we don't really understand what, what that really means. Um, that makes us also the question that we were discussing about chemical tagging. Like when you want to do trees, you want to see how diverse is this chemical environment. And that puts the question of whether chemical tagging can work or not. Uh, so Theo was working on a sample, instead of classifying or cl in, instead of clustering, uh, using clustering algorithm to find the different clusters, uh, very redundant, he looked at um, all these open clusters that are, for which we have abundances measured from uh, the Apogee um, survey, so about 15 different abundances, and it's about 100 uh, open clusters or 60 open clusters at the end that he what he did was to do a supervised classification so making an algorithm a neural network that may be trained to say okay given these abundances these abundances must be, become belong to that cluster so find at the end that um, if you include also field stars the precision for which you can really assign a uh, classify your data in, in clusters you cannot it cannot be better than 80 percent and then the record, which is this uh, parameter of uh, 
how many of all the stars of your cluster are assigned to the cluster in, uh, that they correspond to, it's, uh, it goes down uh, when you add more field stars in, in your sample. So the conclusion is that in the solar neighborhood at solar metallicity, everything is pretty much very homogeneous, making it very hard to do chemical tagging. And also on top of it, then to do this kind of neighbor, uh, this, this uh, tree analysis and then find all these families automatically and perfectly uh, separated from each other. Um, so the challenges of the methods we're using right now is that on one hand, the, and why it appears here, but not there. So yeah, so the challenges are, on one hand, with this neighbor joining algorithm that we're using, every tip is going to be one star. So if in our data set, like the Gala one or like the, the other one of Casali contains sibling stars, which is likely, they will end up in separate branches. So as they were two different populations or units or uh, events, I don't know what other words we, we used to discuss before. So we have to group them first, but then grouping them first is not so easy if you use chemistry alone, because we know that we cannot do a better job than probably 80% when we add the fields. So it's very difficult to group them. It's very difficult to calibrate that grouping, because if you base your calibration on the open cluster data that is available today, you're also biased to young stuff that is metal rich, and, and that's more or less what we have for open clusters. So that's kind of some of the, uh, the challenges in this regard. And then we also know that obviously the Milky Way is complex, uh, has a complex story, and that means that it's not probably going to be tree-like, the evolutionary history, and the neighbor joining trees are, are trees. And then there are questions about, we don't really know exactly which uh, elements are the most important. So we're also investigating that kind of stuff. And finally, Without a model that can assign a probability of that node existing or that leaf uh, being there, um, we don't really know whether the history we are trying to reconstruct from these trees made out of data are making any sense. So to progress in this, we have to develop these models and uh, we also need to work with the simulations. So we have been working with simulations because the simulations have the advantage that we know the history, right? The history may not be necessarily the history that we could see in nature, but at least we can control that history because we build it like we want. Um, so that's the work of uh, uh, Daniela, who just finished her PhD in December. That's her degree. Yay! Uh, um, she worked on the simula a simulation that was computed by Patricia's group. Um, it's a galaxy in isolation didn't have uh, no other galaxy perturbing that galaxy. So she evolved quietly, made a disk, uh, all very, all very nice. Um, and that simulation follows all these, these elements. So the, um, the production of these elements is in, in, um, encoded. And, and then we have at the end an, out, an output of uh, the evolution of all these elements. The first question we made ourselves very basic are we making really, are we measuring noise in these trees or are we measuring some level of evolution, right? So the first question is that one. And also like, given that there are so many trees, we also need to understand, we cannot make a tree out of the 100,000 particles that simulation produce, we need to make a selection. So this figure here shows the difference or the distribution of um, random trees and then trees built out of the simulated data when we use 10 particles, 50 particles, 100 particles, or 200 particles. And we can see that when we take only 10 particles, random particles out of the simulation, we can see that the distribution of this tree looks exactly like a random tree, which means that if you take just half 10 particles, you are probably going to make a beautiful story with a tree that is just nice, right? So. At, from 100 particles above, one can see that the difference between a random tree and a, and a phylogenetic tree looks significantly different. And then we may be starting to have trees that have some phylogenetic information. 
So this is how it looks like, the tree of 100 particles. And you can see that it's pretty very, it's quite different for a random tree. If you remember what I said about the Gala tree before, the branch lengths are quite long in random trees, and these trees are also pretty kind of um, balanced. So you have uh, all the time bifurcations and, and more bifurcations coming out, while this one has uh, a, a very specific uh, and imbalanced shape in which each of these uh, nodes is essentially a fossil record of, of the next one. So yeah, that's uh, we were happy that actually what we're trying to do um, is going somewhere. The next experiment was to look at different regions in this simulation. Um, so that's the disk. This is going looking for above. So these are four different regions with these different colors, and we can make trees of these regions, which are shown here, but for some reason not here. So um, they all look very different, uh, similar. It's very difficult to compare them, like that, because they are different tips. And because they rotate like that, it's also not very easy to connect one with the other. Because if I assign that tip number one and with tip number one here, they are not the same particles, so it's very difficult to link them. So we need to find ways to parameterize these trees such that we can compare them. So one thing we did here was to compare the tree length, which is essentially the distance from the root. And you can compare um, this as a function of the age of the particle. But in the present date, if we focus here, uh, you can see that there is a difference of the tree length between this one and that one of almost two decks of difference. So it's quite significant. So we know, because it's a simulation, we know that the star formation histories from the outer and the inner regions are very different. We know by how much, because it's built in the simulation. And we can connect, for example, the tree lengths uh, with that to see uh, the differences in the, in the trees. So I finish uh, here with conclusion that uh, stars are the fossil records that share the history of the ISM. And therefore, we have a standard evolutionary problem here that we can try to solve using evolutionary tools. Um, this is very interdisciplinary work, which brings us to a lot of unknown territories. But that's exciting because there is a huge range of questions that can be addressed, and it's being addressed by by a lot of people and in uh, in this collaboration or this grant, which is led by a, a, a different, it needs to be different universities, different people in different places. Uh, it's intended to train young people, postdocs and students, hire them and uh, try to encourage them to get uh, involved in this uh, complicated <laughs> project. So yeah, I finish. I finish here with another beautiful picture that they took of us in, in October. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, any questions? Thank you. So, yeah, thanks for this talk. Um, I was wondering about uh, some, of, some of these trends, like the trends in the alpha elements and the elements are pretty well known. And I was wondering, uh, does the, do the trees show additional structure beyond these known trends and are there specific uh, temporal evidences that drive the different structures that we see? Yeah, that's that's a, that's a very good question. Um, we've been uh, uh, fiddling a lot with trying to connect, um, for example, the knee um, with you know, with the tree to see if they appear, if this knees appears in, in some part of the tree. And it depends also where you put the root of the tree, because uh, if you don't put the root in it, the trees here, for example, from Daniel, yeah, but we also have the, the knee, oh, which is, I don't know why this, yeah, these trees here, if you don't, we put the root in the oldest, most, most metal poor star, you know, but if you don't put it, then that's that thing here, actually, and that one, uh, that one is is where the alpha metallicity plot has kind of this knee, so it's just there. So if you don't root it here, they appear as two different clicks, and you may think, oh, I have two populations. So you need to be very careful because it's not two populations; it's just the the region in which the rate of of uh, chemical enrichment changes, right? Because you put iron on it. Um, yeah, so we are doing 
several experiments to see uh, how how a specific uh, you know process like a burst that was what we were discussing all this morning may have an impact on on the trees. So far, we are not because these trees also are so basic and we know the galaxies are much more complicated and we don't have a model. I don't think that it's very safe to say, oh, look, everything we're finding that we cannot, that we are not finding in the standard plots, right? At the moment is trying to connect what we know from standard plots here. But I think that, for example, from here, this is interesting. The tree length is interesting because in the age metallicity relation or in the alpha metallicity plot, you may see some differences between these four groups. They are. But they are not so notable. Like uh, the age metallicity relation has uh, this this group, the one that is in the center, may manage to get a metallicity of maybe open one or one dex higher than here. But when you put all the all the abundances together and you calculate the tree length, then you get to two point, you know, one point five or even two dex difference. So I think that's interesting because you can measure a tree length, which is a little bit more. It takes all the data set and all the abundances, and it's a number that you may be able to compare better when you think that you have also uncertainties in your data than going to the youngest star in your population and measuring the abundance of that star and comparing it with the youngest of the other, because then you have the uncertainties of the ages and the uncertainties of the individual measurements, and you may not be able to really see a significant difference between the two. So I do think that the tree length is something interesting that it's more, it enhanced a little bit more the difference than just a standard measurement or an individual measurement. But I don't, I mean, at the moment, like shaping features in the tree and connecting that to some process, uh, yeah, not, not, not yet. <laughs> but with such a complicated simulation, we, we've been looking at simpler simulations that, that, that produce simpler trees, trying to see the more fundamental differences in shape. Mm. Yeah. Any questions online or anyone else here? Well, no. I, I have uh, maybe a general comment on a question. You can go to you can listen correctly. Um, you start from a distance matrix, a formation matrix, right? So every time you have focus, you define the next trees or graphs. Mm -hmm. What bothers me most is actually there are two things. One, it's not clear how to make a decision about what that distance means. Because yeah. we go for a freedom, but it's a bit arbitrary. So in, in, in this particular case of redundancies, you often have a high correlation between them. Yes. So how you, are you trying to find a particular combination that you seem to know is good for a physical reason? Or you are guys also exploring, for instance, some sort of linear combination between them, some sort of Compressed. Yeah, we have tried uh, a lot of different things, and unfortunately, I don't have a conclusion. So I think that it depends on the data set also. What we have found, however, is that um, oh, I, don't, I didn't have the plot here, but um, one of the experiments we did, the 2017 paper, the first one that was published when I was uh, in Cambridge, we took um, we took 17 different abundances, all of them, um, X over FE. Then we, in the, in the 21 paper, the one uh, from Jackson, um, we had 30 abundances for the same data set. So I ah, yeah, just put more and then I will get everything resolved where they couldn't resolve before. But we just had much more mess and the trees were worse. So we started thinking, why is that? So if I have more abundances, I want to have more information, right? And actually, in that book, the Bible, the one that I was showing you, there is a lot of discussions about more data doesn't, or, or more information, not necessarily more information, it's more information, like no more data is more information. So when you add too many elements that are essentially static, like chromium over FEE, which is flat in time, uh, you're adding noise. So you have to, in a way, the if you want to reconstruct history and you want to have your trees with a certain dependency with time, you should put abundances that you know that are changing with time. Abundance ratios, whether this abundance ratio is chromium over iron or chromium over hydrogen or chromium alone, whatever. I don't have the 
answer because it may also depend on the data set you have. Okay. Uh, uh, because my curiosity was like that, if you are just using a domain knowledge or if you try, for instance, to find a compressed version via Yes. Of the um, just so far, so far, um, this this is all the abundances as they come. At some point, we tried to combine them, um, but then we were having all these correlations, and it probably was repeated information, and then I got confused and I didn't know. So it's easier for interpretation like that. But we are, um, in a way, this is a question that rises all the time, and I think that we don't have the answer. Yes, so yeah. Thanks. Uh, in a separate project, not based on trees, we tried those two approaches of what we already know about chemical elements, time scales, and also just PCAing everything. And we do actually see an increase in the ability to differentiate the stellar propositions, mm. but that's such a promise. But we haven't fed that into a tree. Yeah, yeah. If we are linearly correlated, then we say we. But if the correlation is complex, we are not going to present it. Any final questions? Okay. Then uh, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.